Now, some people are already suggesting that the housing market has actually bottomed out. Well, I don't know about that. I think it's a little bit too soon to make some of those conclusions. We'll talk about that, Case Schiller and more. So welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Today is February the 1st. Randy Patrick here putting the realism back in real estate. Hope you are doing well. We're kicking off a new month, and yeah, lots of fun going to happen on a going forward basis. This video is brought to you by our friends at foreclosure.com. If you'd like to check out the distressed properties in your location, your backyard, go to gethousingdata.com. That's gethousingdata.com. It's my affiliate link, and you know what? You can check out and verify what I'm telling you is actually happening where you live today. All right, so gethousingdata.com. Now, this is interesting. I wanted to actually start off the video today with a little bit of a financial uh, point here. So we just witnessed an economic sign that hasn't happened since the peak of the Great Depression in 1932. So basically, we all know that it's pretty tough out there for the average or most people across the country. There's no doubt about that. And economic conditions are much worse than you are being told. I think we all realize that. Our standard of living has been rapidly declining. And what's really alarming is the fact that, um, I guess you could say, it's the disposable income that we have. And I guess, according to Fox Business, the most recent GDP report revealed that the decline in real disposable income uh, w that we witnessed in 2022 was the largest that has been measured since 1932, since the Great Depression. So if you take a look at that, you can see that um, what they're saying here is the most troubling information uh, it fell one trillion in 2022. You can see the graph up there. That's coming from the Federal Reserve. Uh, for context, this is the second largest percentage drop in real disposable income behind only 1932, the worst year of the Great Depression. So basically, um, again, it was something to think about. So that's what they're saying here. So as much as we may think, oh, you know, a little bit of changes or some positive outlooks in the housing market, well, we'll talk about a second. We'll you know suddenly change where we're at. We got a lot more going against us than we have going for us, and kind of like the last housing crisis, you know, it wasn't just one thing that pushed the market over the edge. It was a number of things that sort of happened, sort of all in. They all contribute. They're all happening in succession or or almost simultaneously that sort of push everything over the edge and cause us some economic problems, like we witnessed back in 2008. So nothing to be surprised here, folks. But let's take a look at that. So uh, now talking about people who are saying the housing market's already bottomed. Um, this is kind of interesting. So uh, again, you know, I'm not saying yes or no to anything. I firmly believe what I believe and where it's going to go, and I'm preparing to do what I need to do to, to work in that environment. So you know, I, I'm open to listen to any concepts or any sort of points people want to make about why we're not going to have a housing correction, housing crash, or whatever. But they got to be valid points. Okay, it can't be the same points we've heard over and over again because it's really proving uh, that that's not the case. So again, it may come as a shock to those who've been following the creeping freeze in housing transactions as the bid ask spread grows to a monstrous proportion. Um, and it's a little more, it's, it's basically um, in what's called a, a market indicator um, <clears throat> leading to a record crash in pending home sales. Now I guess it's, it's an actual index. It's, um, ooh, it's house, housing price futures. So basically you know, people are playing the futures game with housing prices. And I've seen a couple reports on this, and I know that there's, I've actually get emails from, from a guy who actually works in this, and I see what he reports on. It's kind of interesting. So basically, what sort of gold, this, this writer is from Goldman Sachs, and he basically is saying that, um, you know, you bet you didn't know there were housing price futures, and they bottomed out in Q4, and they've been rallying. So they basically said that, you know, uh, they're up decidedly after hitting a 16 month low in November. So again, that's sort of what's happening. Uh, in the housing market. So is that an indicator of a housing, you know, recovery or things are getting better? I'm not too sure. Uh, but basically they say it's an un unexpected rebound. Um, and, you know, may, and the reason being could be an unexpected or sort of rebound, maybe a recent report from real estate company Redfin, which last Wednesday reported that the housing market has begun to recover from a trough in the second week of November with buyers returning at a faster pace than sellers. So, Again, I want to be clear here is that, you know, Redfin, of course, is a publicly traded company and they have agents and a lot of other you know, products and they sell and buy property and the whole bit. So clearly, you know, for them, um, their position, their narrative is going to be, hey, everything's good or, or when something good happens, they're going to capitalize on it. And we get that here. 
So essentially, the number of Redfin customers asking for first tours has improved by 17 percentage points from November low and the number of clients contacting. Furthermore, according to the report, Redfin agents to begin the home buying process has improved by 13 points. I've seen more homes go under contract this month than the entire fourth quarter, said a uh, San Jose, California agent. So essentially, they're saying, you know, it points to mortgage applications, which are up 28% from early November. Uh, basically, um, you know, uh, pending home sales rose 3% in December from November. So, you know, real estate's about trends, and we realize that. So we've been downward trending for you know, about six months now. So let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. However, you know, in any market, you're going to see... You're going to see seasonal effects in any housing market or any market for that matter. So we know that typically we find that you know Thanksgiving to to end of December is maybe a lower closing month, but people can still be out um, you know in force looking to buy, and then maybe things will happen in January and February. But realize that okay, the December pending home sales rose November and from December that's the index. So you know three percent is three percent. It's not double digit percent. It's not twenty percent. Again, realize that at that point, you know, it, the year over year was still 30 plus points difference you know, in, in the negative compared to the previous December of 2021 for pending home sales. So as much as we can take these little increases as, as wins, I don't really think they're hugely impacting wins um, when you take a look at the overall housing market and what's happening at this point in time. So um, basically, they're also saying preliminary data. Uh, on the share of Redfin agents offers facing bidding wars points to small upticks in the Seattle and Tampa markets this month. Um, you know, essentially bidding wars are back in Seattle. One of our listings got 12 offers and was under contract, you know, 155 k over the offer price. Um, essentially, you know, that can happen, sure. Um, a Redfin manager in Tampa said three modest single family home prices around 300 wind up in bidding wars in Central Florida with 16, 17, and 23 competing offers, respectively. So that can happen. So again, I'm not suggesting that th these things don't occur. They could be one-offs. It's not like we're seeing every single property um, actually going, uh, having multiple offers. We're, uh, you know, in our area, we, we have an increase in inventory, inventory staying longer on market uh, time frame. Uh, price points are dropping. So again, there's probably a combination of a number of things going on. Also, you know, with respect to the opportunity, you know, if you're a real estate agent, you know, if you're a little bit savvy, what you may do, if you feel strongly about a property, you can price it a little more aggressively, knowing that you're going to have multiple people who are going to look at it and thus create a bit of a bidding war frenzy. So as much as, you know, you know we, we see that there's bidding wars are back, we don't know to what extent. It's it's not that much what they're saying here. And again, you don't know how, whether that was just or, you know organic bidding wars where that was a little bit of a constructive bidding war. So again, I'm not trying to be the negative, you know, Nelly here, but the whole point is is that, you know, we don't have enough data yet to actually be in a position where we can say, oh, the housing market has bottomed out and things are going to go forward. All right. Um, and this, and I love this part here. It says, but while one can accuse Redfin of bias, after all, the company did lay off some 13% of its employees due to the housing market collapse. So Redfin's already gone on record saying, yeah, we're going to have some issues in the future with housing. And then they've adjusted their business accordingly. But again, from the narrative to get people buying, excited, and stock prices and the whole bit, you know, you, you got to kind of work where you see the opportunities, I suppose, right? Um, it's not alone in predicting the housing economy. That's where this Goldman person, um, housing outlook and home sales appears to appear set to turn higher. Mortgage purchase applications have averaged 9% above their October trough in January. Um, Basically, he's, they say Goldman expects that existing home sales could decline slightly further, but will likely bottom in Q1, okay, before rebounding, rebounding modestly by year end. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that, that could happen, but realize that we still, we still don't have the effect of a lot of factors to play in the market yet, okay? Things like the pre-foreclosures, other distressed properties that are starting to, to grow in volume, that are starting to come, I'm not going to come on market yet, but they're becoming noticeable if, if, if you know where to look for them. So eventually they will start to foreclose and eventually come back on the market later on this year. So again, a lot of this is just discussion points. It's based on some very, um, you know, I guess you could say, you know, minute samples. And we're still too early on to see whether we can say personally that, you know, <clears throat> the recovery is actually, you know, happening. Um, <clears throat> 
you know, the forecast that the housing starts will take longer to stabilize, all right? Um, essentially, um, you know, they expect completions to be, you know, one and a half um, million this year, the most since 2007, which will help to clear the backlog of homes under construction and contribute to a modest increase in homeowner vacancy rate. Okay, so we'll see how that all sort of plays out. Uh, again, it's all, it's all, you know, we all can predict. We expect a peak to trough decline in national home price by roughly 6% and for prices to stop declining around mid-year. So that's going on, you know, at, at this point in time. People are, are saying we're going to see that sort of happen in conjunction with the Fed maybe, you know, going a little bit into the, you know, quantitative easing and stopping their QT um, perspective. Well, if we go back to what the Fed was saying, you know, last month, th there's no intention of them actually reducing rates. Um, they may reduce the, you know, the next rate might come in at 25 basis point increase as opposed to a 50 point. But the Fed's kind of gone, gone on record as saying they don't foresee reducing rates um, anytime in 2023. So, I mean, there's going to be challenges, and that's where I think this will still play out. Obviously, they're going to see larger declines in the Pacific coast of Southwest regions, basically because guess what? That's where the more higher priced property is. So typically, the higher they go up, the faster or harder they come down. There's nothing, you know, obviously shocking about that. Higher rates and lower home prices will increase the drag on the gross domestic product growth from negative wealth effects and declining mortgage equity withdrawal. But we believe the aggregate drag on the GDP growth from the housing sector peaked in 2022 Q4 and will moderate uh, to 20, you know, uh, a little bit more in 2023 Q4. So they're basically saying that, you know, the, the I think they're saying here is that the worst is over and things should be slowly improving over the course of the year. Again, we'll have to see if that actually makes sense. And, uh, and now going back to the housing futures, and this is something that, you know, it's tough to explain. Uh, it's bid and ask, it's its futures type thing. Um, it said, it said Goldman is right in pricing in a housing trough that the consequences could confound markets. On one hand, a stabilization in housing will likely make any coming recession less severe. On the other hand, uh, since housing is the primary channel by which the Fed can slow down the economy, any failure to cripple this key U.S. asset um, could mean that Powell will be stuck in a higher for longer mode well longer than the market expects. As a reminder, uh, the Morgan Stanley chart, chart below shows the consensus is that the Fed is about eight months away from its first rate cut, which will probably be followed by about four to five 25 basis point rate cuts. So, you know, the economists and the analysts are suggesting that the Fed's going to cut, but they haven't, they've come out, but again, going back to what the Fed said, they're, they don't plan on cutting. So unless, you know, someone's either not telling the truth or people are wishful thinking, you know, there's a little bit of contradictory information here. So again, that's why we still don't know exactly how this is going to play out, but we sort of have an idea. By the way, folks, if you enjoyed the information that I provide on these videos, if you could help my channel grow and hit the subscribe button, I'd really appreciate that. And if you are a subscriber, if you could just resubscribe, verify your subscription because I lose subscribers all the time. Thank you very much. So moving forward here, let's talk about what? Case Schiller. So the last Tuesday of the month, CoreLogic, the, the S&P, Standard & Poor, CoreLogic, Case Shiller National Home Price Index gets released the last Tuesday of the month. Basically, it's kind of our, you know, this is our, our um, sort of, you know, number one statistic or, or indice that we, index that we look at, and there's indices, but index that we look at across the board to see where housing's at. So ultimately, in the end, we did see, um, you know, an annual gain is dropping. So, you know, it's still increased on an annual basis home price, uh, the home price appreciation, but it's, but it's, decreasing in value every month. So um, it, it reported 7.7 .7 annual gain in November, down from 9.2 the previous month, okay? So there you go. Now, obviously, um, Miami, Tampa, and Atlanta had the highest year-over-year -year gains. That's the way she goes. Ultimately, in the end, um, you know, the best performing cities were in the southeast, clearly. Um, November is the eighth consecutive month that one of our Florida cities has been a national leader. Um, uh, the bronze medal went to Atlanta, edging out Charlotte. Uh, the southeast and south were the strongest regions. The west was the weakest region. So there's no real, um, I guess you could say, uh, shock there as things kind of change in the marketplace here. So you can see that these are the three indices out there. Um, there's a 10 city, 20 city, and a national index. The thick line is the national index. You can see that uh, as time's gone, time has gone on, you can see the peak in the valleys. Obviously, where we are on the right hand of the graph, it's going up exponentially and looks to be coming down exponentially as well, too. So that's interesting to note. Um, this is the other graph. You can see where we were. So the, the middle hump is the 2006 peak, so the previous housing bubble in 2006. You can see the trough there after that in 2012. 
and you can see we were, we were tracking on a, on somewhat of a linear, high linear angle for the few years, and then once sort of 2020 came in, we kind of went up exponentially, and now we've peaked and we've actually you know come down a little bit there. You can see that the the uh, lines sort of you know, coming down on the side of the triangle there. So that's interesting to note. Um, where we are, uh, again, July 2006 was the previous peak. February 12, 2012 was the previous trough. Where the peak is today, the peak is 61% higher or greater than the 2006 peak. So ultimately, in the end, that's 121, you know, well, from, from trough, it's 120, almost 122%. So if you bought in the trough, then in 2012, you've more than, you know, you've doubled your money, which is great, doubled your home value. So again, you know, at the peak, 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 the, the front, you know, for the, the, the number from the peak to peak was about 68%. So we're coming down every month now from peak to peak valuation, which is, which is again, sh shows us where we're going. Here is the, the chart that shows everything across the board. We'll go to that. Atlanta up 12.7% year over year. Boston 6.9. Charlotte 12.6. Chicago 7.7. Cleveland 7.5. Dallas 10.9%. Denver 6.1. Detroit 6.2. Uh, L, L, sorry, Las Vegas, 6.6, .6, LA, 4.4, Miami, which was the leader in home price appreciation year over year, 18.4%, Minneapolis, Minneapolis 4.8, New York, 8.1, Phoenix, 6.3. Wow, big drop in Phoenix because prior to Miami and Tampa this year being, you know, the top of the year over year appreciation, Phoenix held, held that for about 30 some odd, 32, 33 months in a row. So Phoenix is now only increasing uh, what we got here, 6.3% um, year over year. Obviously, it's monthly. It's going down every month. And ultimately, we know there's many more foreclosure filings happening in Phoenix, and things are changing there. Uh, San Diego, uh, sorry, Portland, 3.9%. San Diego, 4.8%. San Francisco is the first city to post a negative year over year appreciation. So it actually truly depreciated from this time last year. So we don't have any, you know, it's not like we're losing appreciation, but still appreciating. It actually, it actually is, you know, it went the other way. It went below the zero, so it actually lost value from last year. That's the first city um, that has actually done this on a year-over-year -year basis, all right? Seattle, 1.5%. Tampa, 16.9%. So there you go. So really, not much is happening. Things are slowing down, and that's what really makes or breaks kind of this this um, this piece of information. To realize that the case shiller home price indice report is really based on two months ago. So here we are looking at this report at the end of January. This is based on November data. So, you know, that's why it's all it's always because of the calculation and, and, and the complexity of the index or indices, it's about a two-month process for them to figure stuff out and produce the information. So, you know, this is November. So, we, you know, December is, is a slow month. Pending sales for December were predict, predicted to be slow. So we'll see what happens. Um, again, you know, time time will tell. Where this where this will head clearly, and then the new year comes. People who want to buy, we understand that. Obviously, we'll have a spring selling season, right? People that, that do that normally spring, early summer. We didn't have much of one last year; it was very disappointing. So we'll see what this year brings. Uh, again, uh, you know, we had a little bit of dip in interest rates during the sort of end of November, December time frame that probably brought out the buyers. Uh, apparently, the numbers gone up a little higher again. So we'll see how that affects the marketplace. And once again. You know, we have a lot of people who are speculating that the Fed will start to reduce the rates. Um, but going from what, you know, if you actually listen to what the Fed's saying from themselves, that they don't intend on doing that. So, we'll, again, we'll see how this all plays out. Very interesting. Uh, housing markets in flux. Two sides of every story. Two sides to every coin. Um, personally, I know where I'm heading with all this. So, and I'm happy and I'm moving forward. Why do you want to be in this market? Well, if we have distressed property opportunities, what can you do? How can you participate? Foreclosure auctions. Bank owned, REOs, real estate owned, right? Bank owned stuff. Um, short sale, short payoff, subject to the mortgage, homeowner and condo association foreclosures, probate estate foreclosures, and what we call foreclosure surplus or overage. That's when somebody loses a property to a foreclosure auction and the bidding price is actually more than what was owed. That creates a surplus, which the homeowner is entitled to after any other claims, etc. on that. So a lot of things happening, a lot of stuff you can participate in in this marketplace. And again, we're open for business. What I mean by that is new home construction. 
Let's talk about that. A lot of builders are trying to close out some models and, and move on some inventory. So if that's interesting to you, connect with me. I can have one of my agents help you for sure. Existing MLS properties, we are seeing more inventory come on so, and some price reductions. So that's getting a little more attractive. Investment opportunities, always there. Lots of off-market stuff, a lot of stuff that I do. Cash flow, Airbnb, fix and flip. You're looking for it. We can probably find it for you. Uh, single family or multifamily, regardless, I do have access to multifamily opportunities. Those are typically in the 100, 100 unit plus area. I have a build to rent, build to flip sort of setup going on as well too. That if you want to explore that, that's I think a great opportunity as time goes on. And we do have, you know, I have access to lenders who can help lend on investment properties and primaries. Um, also hard money lenders, etc. So we have a, we're pretty well networked, pretty well connected where I'm at. Uh, in this marketplace so we can certainly help you with pretty much all your real estate needs all right guys so again lot of stuff going on here i got my new program that's going to be very important this year because this year will be the year of the foreclosures it's going to start happening we're already seeing that increase right now so if you want more information please reach out to me there's my email it's the best way to get a hold of me so thank you once again for the views for the likes the comments please share the video with your family and friends if you're not a subscriber please subscribe i look forward to speaking with you hopefully in a couple days